Welcome to the behavioral sciences section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 26 to 30. So first I'll show you guys a question so you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 26, 27, 28, 29, and 30. Now let's go through the questions together. So in question 26, it says, as per the dramaturgical approach to social interaction, an example of the front stage self would be what? So we are talking about the dramaturgical approach and we're talking about the front stage self. So this approach says that we have a front stage self and a backstage self. The front stage self is what you present to other people when you have others around you. So when you have an audience, you present yourself differently because you're being viewed by others as compared to your backstage self, which is when you are truly acting like you actually would. So for example, how you would act at your job in front of your other peers, the other employees that are there and your boss as well, compared to how you act at home with your family, that would be your backstage self. So we're asked for something that is related to the front stage self. So in option A, it says behaviors of an individual as they prepare dinner with their significant other at home. That's incorrect because this would be the backstage self. This would be the real personality that this person has. So A is incorrect because they're preparing dinner at home with someone that they're really close to as their significant other. So that's their backstage self. They don't really have a reason to portray their personality differently in order to like impress this person or anything. That's their, their true self. B is a group of individuals completing a task with greater efficiency, efficiency than just a single individual. That's not really relevant to talking about the front stage and backstage self. So front stage self is really how you present yourself when you are with a group and that's different from your actual personality when you're by yourself or just with your family at home and so this is just it's it's not even talking about how someone presents themselves but just the efficiency at which work is completed so it's not really relevant c is saying an in-group protesting against an out-group moving into the community it this option also isn't really completely relevant to what we're talking about and if someone is in an in-group and then they're pro protesting against something else, it seems likely that they're still showing their, their backstage self. They're not really trying to impress anyone because of a reason such as, as if it's their boss or something. They don't really have that type of reason to behave differently. If they're in their in-group, it should be someone or should be a group of people in which they feel comfortable. So if you're protesting for a cause, that must mean that you really care about the cause and then it is kind of your backstage self. It's... It's your true personality. And then finally, option D is saying a CEO is making a presentation to a small board of investors. Yes, that's correct. So there's a CEO, they have to make a presentation to a board of investors, meaning that they have to present themselves in a certain way to impress their audience. And so that is an example of the front stage self. The way that the CEO is going to be presenting is not gonna be just how they act normally when they're at home because they'd be a lot more casual when they're at home, but here they have an important presentation to give, so they need to appear very confident and assured in whatever the whatever the state of the company is that they're showing to their investors. So therefore, D is the best answer for this question. In question 27, it says, a proponent of the theory of multiple intelligences would be least likely to argue what? So we're talking about the theory of multiple intelligences, and then what would they be least likely to argue for? So what is something that someone who believes in this theory would not really agree with? So the theory of multiple intelligences says that we have many different forms that intelligence can take instead of just the normal one that comes to our head, like doing well on a test or that type of problem solving. It's not just, just book smarts that's intelligent, but intelligence can also be related to musical intelligence. There's also mathematical intelligence. There's kinesthetic intelligence, which is knowing your body and how that moves in space. So there are those different types of intelligences. And so someone that believes in this theory, they would be against something that says that intelligence is really more set rather than it being fluid and able to change over time and having different forms. So option A is saying intelligence is composed of fluid and crystal intelligence, which are themselves indivisible intelligences. So yes, this is something which the person would not agree with. This is actually a different type of 
intelligence theory than the theory of multiple intelligences. So the second part is saying that these two types of intelligence are indivisible, meaning that we just have fluid and crystal intelligence, and then we can't break them up into the different types, like musical and all of those other types. So that is going against the theory of multiple intelligences. It's, it's just saying that intelligence is really, it's a type that we really think about when we think about the word intelligence, so that book smarts, that's what intelligence really is. And then the two forms are fluid and crystal. And this is a lot more set. So fluid intelligence is kind of your your flexible intelligence, being able to reason things when they're actually presented in front of you. So problem solving and all of that. So that's your actual intelligence day to day. And then crystal intelligence is the accumulation of knowledge and facts that you've built up as your life has gone along. So those are the two different forms of intelligence according to that theory. And this theory believes that they're a lot more set and they don't really have different forms. And because of that, it goes against the theory of multiple intelligences. And then option B is saying emotional intelligence is a true intelligence. This is something that a person would believe if they believed in multiple intelligences. So that's an incorrect answer. C is saying a single number is unlikely to encapsulate the intelligence an individual possesses. So they would also agree with this because they think that just the IQ shouldn't determine your intelligence because you might not be good at the type of questions that the IQ test is asking you to solve, but you have different types of intelligences. So that is something that they would agree with. And then finally, option D is saying an individual may have competencies in a multitude of intelligences. So of course, that's something that they would agree with. And so A is the only one that they really wouldn't agree with. Question 28 is asking us which of the following long-term United States demographic projections is expected to create sweeping, vast societal changes and significantly impact the healthcare industry. So we want to have vast societal changes and then also impact the healthcare industry. So for this question, all the answers will most likely lead to some pretty dra dramatic so societal changes. but. There's only one which is really going to significantly impact the healthcare industry. So option A is saying if the wage gender gap decreases, this would lead to some important societal changes, but it's not clear just how dramatic it would be. We're talking about something that's sweeping and vast. And so this would, this would affect a lot of people and mainly it would be for females, but females and especially mothers as well. But it might not be as vast of a change as the other options that are presented. So option B, for example, is talking about non-whites becoming a demographic majority. That's, that's like a much more widespread impact because a lot of the population is non-white. And then we're also talking about something significantly impacting the healthcare industry. Yes, this one would impact the healthcare industry because there doesn't seem to be like a difference in healthcare that great between males and females, but you can see a lot of evidence for differences in healthcare that's provided to people of different races. So if you are of a minor minority group, there's a chance that you're going to have access to less, less great healthcare resources. And so there is a discrepancy in the healthcare that they receive. So if non-whites became a demographic majority, then they could change that a lot in the healthcare industry. And then they can also lead to a lot of other vast societal changes in other areas besides just healthcare industry as well. So B would be the best answer because of that reason. C is saying if the US share of world population decreases, so we're talking about which demographic change in the US will lead to like a, a big change in the US. If the US's share of the world population decreases, that doesn't really, it shouldn't really change the actual conditions in the US that much. Just relative to other people, their population has decreased. So either the U.S. has a lower population now or the rest of the world has an increased population relative to the U.S. But since the uh, different proportions of individuals is going to be assumed to be the same, that doesn't seem likely that they're going to be any dramatic societal change. And option D is saying acceptance of diverse sexual orientations increases. So just like A, this would lead to some pretty enormous societal changes but it wouldn't be as widespread as if it was for non-whites becoming a majority. And then there isn't as great a link in different healthcare that is received 
of people of different sexual orientations. So B for this question would be the best, the strongest answer. In question 29, it says, according to Isaac's personality difference arises mostly from what? So his theory relates to different dimensions of personality. And then one of the key factor is that personality is determined by biological differences. So based on biology, you're going to inherit a certain type of nervous system, and that is going to determine the way you interact with the environment and just the way you think and respond overall. So because of that, that's going to have a key effect on your personality that arises. And so B is the correct answer, which relates to Isaac's theory. A is talking about environmental differences. And no, Isaacs believed that it was mainly based on biology and things that you inherit that are things that you inherit. These are more important than other factors such as the environment, more important than social and cultural differences. That's also kind of the same thing as A. It's pretty related. It's also the environment. And then D factor analyses of personality differences. No, it's not due to some analysis of personality differences either. It's due to biology. So B is the correct answer for 29. In question 30, we're asked which of the following work-related activities may be most prone to social loafing. So social loafing is the tendency for people in a group to put in less effort than if they were working on a task on their own. So if you have to do a presentation, for example, on your own, you put in a lot more effort because all of the mark is dependent on you and then all of the work that has to be put into your presentation that's also it's dependent on you whereas in a group if you have a group presentation you believe that other people are going to make up for your lack of effort so you put in less effort than you normally would and that's because the work is a lot more divided among the group members and yeah so that's what social loafing is so we're looking for something like that someone putting in less effort into a task when they're in a group as compared to if they were doing it individually so option a is saying Leading a meeting in front of colleagues? No, this would not be prone to social loafing. If you're a person leading a meeting, then that means that you're the person that's leading it and you're in front of other colleagues and then you're leading a meeting. So since it's you, the person that's leading the meeting, it's an individual task. And so there isn't any reason for you to social loaf on this task. If a group of you were leading some meeting, then you might social loaf. B is saying cleaning one's office cubicle. So once again, this is an individual task, so there's not going to be social loafing. C, sending a divisive email to a project manager. If it's just you, the person sending the email, and it's not like a lot of other people coming together and sending an email together to have a change occur, then it's an individual task. And so once again, it's not relevant to social loafing. And then D is the correct answer then. Working as part of a larger group to complete a time-sensitive project. So similar thing to a presentation, if you were working on a time sensitive project on your own, you would put in a lot more work. But if you're working as part of a larger group, then you believe that other people will also put in a good amount of work so that you don't have to put in as much work as you would before. And so you believe that the work is a lot more divided and therefore you're gonna loaf a little bit. So D is the only one that relates to social loafing. So it's the correct answer. That's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course on teachable.com. The link is in the description below. In that course, we go through a lot more questions and go through all the different answers explaining why they're right or wrong. Other than that, make sure to subscribe to our channel to keep up with all the videos that we post here. And that's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one.